So I would like to thank you, Alexander, for the opportunity for the invitation to talk here. And so this is a work in, in progress with Nicola Pagani from the University of Liverpool. And we're going to talk about bring other cycles in compactified Jacobians. OK, so let's start a little bit by recalling what are the bring other cycles. So we begin with a smooth projective curve. And call it JD, it's degree D Jacobian. So what are what is JD? So JD is the space that parameterizes line bundles of degree D on the this curve. So D space, when you look at J0, it's an abelian variety. You have a product which is given by the tensor product. And if you have a complex curve, we have that this Jacobian is essentially given by CG. G is the genus of the curve, uh, quotient by some lattice. And when we have the degree D Jacobian, it's essentially a G, G0, J0 C torsor. And what is the Brunner cycle? So here we're only interested, so usually we have some R here as well, but we are only doing R equals zero in, in this talk. So the Brunner cycle of this curve is on the Jacobian of degree D is just the line bundles that has some section. So this can also be seen as the image of the Abel map. So we have copies, D copies of the curve that goes to the Jacobian that takes D points and takes these points to the line bundle given by the sum of these D points. So this is the Brunner locus inside the Jacobian, and we want to give like a formula for the, the class of this Brunner locus in the Chow group of the Jacobian. So to we always think that the, the genus is the degree is less than the genus, otherwise this locus will be essentially will be everything. Okay. So how do we compute the class of this locus? So this is pretty classic. So we have the Jacobian over the Jacobian. You can take kind of the universal family, which is the Jacobian times the curve, and we have a universal line bundle L on these. We have a universal line bundle L, which over a point here. So remember that a point in the Jacobian parameterizes line bundles on C of degree D. So if we have a point in the Jacobian, we look at the fiber, which is a copy of the of the curve. And if you take this tautological line bundle and restrict it to this fiber, you get precisely the line bundle L. So to compute the, the idea to compute the class of the Brunner de Lossi is to use some Tom Portius formula. So we will describe a map of sheaths in the Jacobian, whose degeneracy locus will be precisely the, the Brunner de Locus that we defined before. So to do that, so let me try and draw some picture here. So we have this curve C, and here, so we have the curve C, and here we have JC, and we have the product, and we choose some points sufficiently, sufficiently many points, P1, Pn. This gives like sections that are also called P1, Pn. And what we do, we will tensor the line bundle well through the sum of all these sections. So this is. Uh, pretty straightforward exact sequence. We take the injection of L in L tensor these all these sections, and then we have the restriction of L D to all of these sections. And now the idea, so we have this exact sequence on, so this is an exact sequence on J C times C. Okay, L is the tautological line bundle and D is the sum of all of these sections here. And now we want to take the push forward of this, of this exact sequence. So the push forward of L, so D0 is the push forward of L. Because generically, since we are in the degree that is, mo that is smaller than the genus, this L has no sections. So the push forward will be zero. 
then we have the push forward of L of D, and this will be a vector bundle because D is sufficiently large. So the R1 of the thing will be zero because you have no higher cohomology when you have a higher degree on, on a curve. And this thing is supported. So this is supported on the sections P1, Pn. So it will also have R1 equals zero. So when you take the long sequence in, in, in cohomology, just to push forward, you get, you just have the R1 of L and then everything else, all, all the other R1s vanish. So then you have this map and let's see what this map looks like on, on a fiber. So, so this map F is the map we will be interested, which is a map between vector bundles. So I already said that, but since LD is sufficiently ample, so it means that it's very positive, this thing is a vector bundle, and the fiber at a point L is precisely the sections of LD. So let me just draw the picture again. So we have JC here. Here we have JC times C. And we have chosen a point here, which corresponds to a line bundle L. And over this fiber, the universal line bundle L of D is essentially L summing up D, which is the sum of the points. And since the R1, since the higher cohomology vanishes, we have that the push forward commutes with base change. And that means that over this fiber, the push forward is precisely the sections of L of D. And what is this map F on this fiber is precisely the evaluation of H0 at D at the points P1, Pn. So this map F, which is lives on the Jacobian, is a map of vector bundles. So this is the push forward of LD, and this is the sum of LD restricted to Pi. And we are looking at just a single point in the Jacobian, you have a map between these two vector spaces, which is the, the evaluation map. It takes a section here and takes to the section evaluated at the point PI. So what happens is that the, the kernel of this map is precisely the, the sections of L, because you have sections of L of P1 plus Pn and that vanishes at each PI. So, in particular, we have that the cycle WD corresponds precisely to the points of L where this, this kernel is not zero. So that means that, that we can describe this cycle as the degeneracy loci of the map F. Let me call the map F. So the map F is a map between these two vector bundles. And we can use the Tom Portius formula that tells you what class you get when you have uh, the degeneracy locus of a map between vector bundles. So the class, the Brunner class, will be the G minus the churn class of the difference. So I should have been written here. So this is CG minus D of the difference of these two vector bundles. So let's call this E0, E1. So I think I should do E1 minus E0 here. And this difference is precisely the, we can use Witten's formula to see that the difference between E1 minus E0 is precisely the R1 push forward of L. So we have a formula for the Brunner locus, which is the churn class of the higher cohomology of the push forward of L, of the tautological line bundle. And we can actually write this as the churn class of this thing. So this thing is just formally the R0 minus R1. And remember that the R0 is the push forward of L, which is zero. So we have this formula for the for the Blue Nether cycle for a, a smooth projective curve. And if WD is of expected codimension, 
which means it's of codimension G minus D. Then we have that the class of this cycle is precisely the Brunner class that we have defined here. So this holds in the child group. Of the Jacobian of the curve, see. So, what is it that we want to do now? So, this is for a single curve. So, we want to do this in a universal setting. So, what does that mean? So, we will look at the moduli space of curves. So, we have MGN, and MGN is the moduli space the parameterizing smooth projective curves of genus G and N paralyzed distinct market points. So we have a curve and we have n market points. So this is the moduli space MGN. Each point corresponds to a curve with market points. And over this space, we have a universal Jacobian. And what is the universal Jacobian? Is the space parameterizing pairs, curve, line bundle. So uh, I, we usually forget about the points and write these simply as C and think that the market points are implied. So we have this Jacobian. So the points here are classes of curves with market points, and the points in the Jacobian are classes of curves together with a choice of a degree D line bundle. And this is essentially a forgetful map. So we have that the inverse image of a point in the moduli space is precisely the Jacobian of this curve. So this is essentially a universal picture that we had before. We are doing the same thing. So instead of doing for one curve, we're doing for all the curves. And we can, we can repeat exactly the same thing we did for this universal Jacobian here. So we have a universal family over this universal Jacobian. This universal family has a tautological line bundle that has the same property as before. So we have a tautological line bundle L here. And with the property that for each point, remember that our point C and L here is a point on the universal Jacobian that parameterizes the curve C and the line bundle L. We have that the fiber over this point of the universal family is a copy of C, of the curve C. And the tautological line bundle restricted to this fiber is a copy of the line bundle well. Okay. And then we can define this Brunner cycle on the universal Jacobian exactly in the same manner we had before. We define as the G minus D churn class. of minus the derived complex of the push forward of L. Okay. But now we have the, the usual problem, which is that these things are not compact. So this MGN is, a, is not a, a proper moduli space because you can have the generations of smooth curves to singular curves. So now we want to draw to do the same thing again, but now we want to change. So we want to change this construction to the minimum for the compactification of the moduli space of curves. So we now want to set up MGN. We want to change the to look at the MGN bar, which parameterizes a curve, which is a stable and pointed curve of genus G. So I'm doing axis and, and C. Let, let's just call everything C. So what is a, a stable when you point to the nodal curve is a not is a a stable curve is a nodal curve C. So you can have a curve with several nodes, something that looks like this. We have two market points P1, P2. On we have to mark smooth points. And each of these components may have some genus. So here we have the genus of these components can be one and so on. And what we ask is if we have a component of genus zero, then it has at least three distinguished points on it. So if this component has genus zeros, it must have two nodes or three nodes and at least one 
market point in this case. So this will make it this curve uh, stable curves. So you have at least three distinguished points on every uh, rational component of the curve. So this is the compatification, but to have a clear picture, remind that we have a Jacobian and the modulized space of curves. So we have to compactify <coughs> the Jacobian. <coughs> and how do we compactify Jacobians? And that is something that has been going on from at least the, the 60s, I guess. And we have some problems. And the first problem is that the limits of line bundles are not unique. So if you have, let's say, a family of curves, so you have a degeneration of a smooth curve to a, another curve, which has two components, C1 and C2. And let's take L, a, a line bundle on this family of curves, which we can think as essentially a sequence of line bundles from the smooth curves to the, to the singular curve. Okay, let, let's think of degree zero for now, just to, to give an example. And so over a point S here, we have the fiber CS, and we can think that the restrictions of this line bundle L to CS, uh, the limit is the restriction of L to C1 union C2, which is the fiber, the singular fiber here. So we can think, uh, but what can we do? We can twist this line bundle L by some divisors C1. So C1, so C is a surface, C1 is a curve on the surface. So I'm assuming that C is move. So C1 will be a Cartier divisor. So, and it, we can change L by L of C1. And what happens is that when we restrict this thing to the curve CS, this is the same thing as L restricted to CS because the C1 does not intersect the smooth fibers. But the, the, the limit is different, but the L tensor OC of C1 restricted to the special fiber is not the same as L restricted to C1 union C2. So we have to, to, to deal with that. So whenever your curve, your nodal curve is not irreducible, this thing can happen. Okay, so what we have to do, we have to essentially choose which limit we, we want. So here I'm, I'm writing the degrees. So each line in L, we have that. So L has relative degree zero, but when we restrict to each component, L of C1 and L of C2, you have two degrees. So this has degree D1 on C1, this has degree D2, D2 on C2, and D1 plus D2 is zero, is the total degree of the curve. So let's look here. So here you have all the possible degrees. So these are D1, D2. And okay, something I didn't mention. So you can twist by C1, but actually you can twist by any multiple of C1 and you get uh, several different possible limits for these, for these things. So, and what are the multi-degrees, the degrees of these limits? So for instance, if the degree of C1 is zero of L restricted to C1, and that means that the degree of L restricted to C2 is zero. When we add the C1, what happens when we add C1? So the picture, it was something like this. So we have C1, here we have C2. So when we do C1 intersecting C2, this is precisely three points. So when we do L of C1 restricted to C2, this is L of C or L restricted to C2 plus the intersection of C1 and C2, which is add three degree. So we have that 
the possible limits of L in that picture, the multi degrees, they skip at precisely the number of nodes. So if the degree were to be 0, 0, the other possible limits, when we trace it by C1, is something adding 3 or subtracting 3 on the, the component C1. So we can do the same picture if the degree would be 1 minus 1, you have these possible multi degrees for the twists. So this picture continues. And so on, if the degree is 2 minus 2. So what do we have to do if we want to choose a unique limit? So what means choose a unique limit? We want to choose a particular thing here. So we want to to have something that is is unique. So what we have to do is, as, as the, the thing suggests, we have to choose precisely three multi degrees that we accept. So we say we don't want all possible limits. We just want limits that have some possible degrees. So for instance, we can choose these three degrees. So now we want to say, OK, we want a family of curves. So we have C2S, and our picture is like this. And we have a shift on the family. We just want the shifts, the, the line bundles, that on this special curve has either degree 1 minus 1, degree 0, 0, or degree minus 1, 1. And then that means that the, the limit will be will become unique. And how do we get how do we get to these three? So what we usually do, we choose some rational numbers. So we have C1 and C2. Now let's say we can choose rational numbers summing up to zero. One for each component, so and minus 0 0.3. And then we just take the degrees that are closest to this thing. So if we choose 0 0.3 and minus 0 0.3, we have precisely, we take the three degrees. Remember that three is precisely the number of degrees that we have to take to make the, the thing unique. And then we choose the degrees that are closest to this thing here. Okay, and, but now we, we have some kind of some, some boundary issues because what happens if you choose numbers that is not clear what, what three closest degrees mean. So if we choose these numbers here, you have, it's not clear how between these two you have to choose. So we have something, some choices that are kind of ambiguous. So we have to, to kind of think uh, a choice of these numbers. No, not all of them are good. Some of them will have some ambiguous thing, but most of them will be okay. So for instance, if you choose this one, now we have to choose this possible three degrees here. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that in choosing these limits, we have to choose essentially a parameter to construct these moduli spaces that parameterize line bundles on nodal curves. So let me give a proper definition. So what is a polarization on a nodal curve? So a polarization is a choice of a rational number or real number uh, for each of the components of the curve. So if you have a curve with several components, we want to choose a number for each component that adds precisely to the degree of the, the line bundles we're trying to parameterize. So once you have chosen these rational or real numbers, so we say that the line bundle L is phi stable if it's multi degree. That means that the degree on each component is close to these ones that we have chosen. And close means something like this. I won't get into the detail, but it's essentially we we don't we don't allow any any multi degree to be to be stable, to be a limit of something. We want to to tell you what multi degrees are are possible to, to take limits. 
Okay, but we have seen that some polarizations are not good. So we call that phi is non-degenerate if the phi stable multi-degrees are enough to have all limits. So the end of thing is precisely this less here. So for some phi's we can have equality, and when you can have equality, it's not you can have too much things. So the, the don't degenerate phi's is precisely the phi's where these can never be equal. So essentially, if a phi is irrational enough, so these two things will be rational and and we will be good. So so just trying to explain a little, a little bit more. So why is a union of components is a subcurve? Phi of y is just the sum of phi ij and delta y. So i y is a subcurve. Delta y is just the number of nodes in y. So is y intersecting the complementary closure? Okay, so how do we go from here? So now we have to do this universally. So what it means to do universally, you have to, to choose these numbers, one for each stable curve. So we have a lot of possible stable curves with a lot of possible genus. And for each stable curve, you have to choose a number for them, for the components of them. So of course you cannot, we have that these curves, they live in a family. So this choice, they may must have be compatible. So you cannot choose any numbers. You have to choose numbers that works well when you have a, a family of curves. And the collection, the collection of all these numbers is called a universal polarization, which is essentially some combinatorial data that you can give uh, to this moduli space of curves. And we say that these phi is non-degenerate if everyone, every phi c is non-degenerate for every c. Okay, so then. Once you have a polarization, you can construct a proper delimit Manfred stack that parameterizes pairs CL, where C is a genus GN stable curve, and L is a phi C stable. So now we have fixed the, the possible multi degrees that we want L from have, and we have a phi C stable, and we have to add a little notion. We can we have to change line bundles by torsion free rank one shifts. So on, on C. And this, I, I only talked about you, the uniqueness of the limit, but you, you must also make sure that the limit exists. So it's also the case that some sequence of line bundles on smooth curves doesn't have a limit for a nodal curve. So you have to add these torsion free sheaves to have to also have the existence of the limit. Okay. So now the picture is a little bit different than we had before. So before we have just G, we have J, D, and D to the moduli space of curves, but this thing was essentially unique. But now when we construct the compatification, the, the compatification depends on this choice of a polarization phi. So actually we have like, and these things, they are non-isomorphic. Non if you change phi's, you get uh, a different uh, universal compact phi Jacobian. So when we do the the Brunner cycle on these Jacobians, you have like a lot of cycles in different uh, uh, Jacobians. So and how? So I our goal is how do we compare uh, these things? So we want to look at the space of all possible polarizations. So we essentially have a, a, a fine space or a, a vector space that parameterizes all possible polarizations phi. And in this vector space, we have that. So if we have two polarizations that, that are very close to each other, then they will give precisely the same multi degrees. So if we go back here, if I had chosen a different thing, which is still very close to 
So these will get precisely the same multi degrees. So you have some wiggle room in the polarizations to to have the same uh, Jacobian. And what happens is that, and when we, so let me draw a picture that I take from from Caspagani paper. So we have this picture of the stability spaces. So your, so all the possible polarizations, they live in a, in kind of a vector space. But we have some walls that corresponds to polarizations where the the thing is not well well defined, where the moduli space will not give a, a proper the Lee Manford stack. So and what happens? So you have these walls, and each one of these polytopes, all the polarizations here will give the same Jacobian. But when you cross to the other thing, you get a different Jacobian. So so our idea is, OK, we want to compare the Brunner cycles in each of these Jacobians. And how is it that we're going to do that? OK, so let's talk about what the Brunner cycles look like on these compact five Jacobians. So any questions so far? OK. So, and the idea is essentially the same thing. We have the compactified Jacobian. <clears throat> this compactified Jacobian has a universal family. And on the universal family, we have a tautological line bundle. So we can repeat the thing that we did before. We can define a Brunner cycle as the G minus G term class of the derived complex of the push forward of L. Okay. And here you, you actually have to be a little bit more careful because you can define the loci, the Brunner the loci in this compact Chavai Jacobian as precisely the line bundles that has a section. Or you can do kind of the the closure thing. You can take the Brunner the loci in the in the smooth in the locus of smooth curves and take the closure of the of this loci in the compact phi Jacobian. Okay, so these things are actually different. So we have to, to be a little bit careful here. So if the the W D G N of phi, if this has this the expected codimension, which is rarely the case, then the class of this cycle will be the class we're defining above. But as I said, this is this happens only for particular choices of, of the degree and of phi. And we will work with this definition of the Brunner cycle, which is the one that gives uh, a class that we can actually compute and work with. OK, so, so what do we want to do? So again, we want to compare cycles. So we have two polarizations. And we have a cycle on each one. So I dropped the GN here, but GNN is always fixed. So we want to compare these two Brunner cycles that live on two different Jacobians. So to compare these two Brunner cycles, we actually have to see how first we have to compare both spaces. And how do we compare the Jacobian of phi1 and the Jacobian given by the polarization phi2? So they are different. They are usually different spaces, but they have like a common open set, which is the Jacobian of degree D. So we have like a birational morphism because on the locus of smooth curves, these things are, are isomorphic. So they they both are compactifications of the same thing JD. So we have this birational morphism that takes the CL to CL if C is smooth. And if C is nodal, we we have a little bit of work to do. So because it's not clear that something that is phi one stable will be phi two stable as well, because the the multi degree that we have chosen for the line bundle well on phi one cannot be the the one that is accepted for phi two. So what we do when we have a birational morphism, we can we have our usually have a resolution of the map. 
So we can find a a space that depends on phi one, phi two, and we have birational morphisms p one and p two from here that makes this thing commute. So now that we have this resolution, so we have two cycles. We have a cycle here, and we have a cycle here. And how do we compare these two? So we take this cycle, we take pull back here, and then we will take push forward. To JD phi one. So, and what we want to do, we want to compute the difference between these two cycles. And this is how we compare the the Brunner cycles that we get on these two different Jacobians. So, and the first thing we have to notice that this difference does not depend on the resolution, because if you have another resolution so we do have a minimal resolution then we can use this minimal one to to define these but we can take any resolution and any birational morphisms p1 and p2 and this difference will be the same because the pullback and push forward will be the same by projection formula so what we have to do is we have so we want to find a suitable resolution where we can actually do this these computations okay and to do that there is some some machinery that that we can use so how do we resolve abel maps so what is uh, uh, an abel map so um so we have a family of curves and a line bundle l on this thing, I, I'm assuming that this family has a smooth generic fiber. And for any polarization, so we have a map, which is a rational map that takes. So here is, is our family of curves. We have S, which can be higher dimensional. And we have a family of curves. We can have something nodal here. So S, and here is the fiber over S. So we can have a map that goes to S to the Jacobian of degree D Jacobian that takes a point S to the point D Jacobian that parameterizes the pair, the curve, which is the fiber over S, and the restriction of this line bundle to this fiber. And this is a rational map because usually when you are over nodal curves, uh, this thing may not be uh, phi stable. So this is rational because uh, L restricted to CS may not be phi stable. Okay, and we have some some results that tell us how do we resolve the map. So the, the result I'm stating here is actually the one from this last paper, but this has been some work done in this case. So these three things here are for when, when S is the modelized space of curves. So if S is toroidal, and for those who are familiar with this, if you have like a logarithmic family of curves, family of logarithmic curves, we can have an exp we have an explicit toroidal modification as tilde such that the composition is defined everywhere, or that means that the composition actually is the the resolution of this map. So what toroidal means? Toroidal means that locally the thing looks like a toric variety. And what is a toroidal modification? So if something looks locally like a toric variety, and for toric varieties you have each toric variety has an associated fan and its cones and you could take a refinement of the fan and a refinement of the fan will give a birational map like this so this essentially so this toroidal modification is essentially taking a refinement of the fan given by s if s were, were toric and so th these things can be made precise but that's what toroidal modification means so we have kind of this explicit modification given by some refinements of fans. Okay, so how do we construct 
these things. So here we will do the, the simple case where we have phi1 and phi2, which live on adjacent polytopes. That means we're crossing uh, a wall here, and we want to compare what's happened to the to these things when we're crossing just one wall. So I'm, I'm not trying to compare far away polarizations, but polarizations that are close enough to each other. So we can apply the this construction here to find this resolution. And so unfortunately, this construction will give something that is singular, and it's very difficult to do intersection theory on singular things. So we can make a, a small modification, so we can still use these, these results to find another another possible choice for these, this resolution. And our, our first result is that we can find uh, a sequence of blow-ups along a smooth loss side. So we start with phi1, and we do a lot of blow-ups. And each of these blow-ups is along some smooth loss side, and we get to, to this phi1, phi2, which makes this thing a proper morphism. And we can describe explicitly which thing we have to to blow up here. So, and now that we have these these sequence of blow ups, we we can do some intersection theory. So we and we have a way to compare the Chow groups of these things. So we can make some some computations here. Okay, so okay to to describe now these these singlets, we the next step is to describe what are these smooth loss high. So first, let's talk a little bit about the boundary strata of the modulized space of curves and of the Jacobian. So as I said, so, so we have a compatification of the modulized curves, so we we allow curves to be to be nodal. And how do we describe the boundary or the, the extra curves that we are adding to the compatification of the modelized space of curves? So to describe the boundary, what we have, we kind of have to fix the combinatorial type of the curve, which we usually call the, the dual graph. So for instance, I choose a picture like this. So we have a curve which has three components, C1, C2, C3, such that C1 and C2 intersect in three nodes, and C3 intersect each of C1 and C2 in one node, and C1, C2, and C3 has genus G1, G2, G3. So we have to choose this combinatorial data, for each possible combinatorial data like this that have total genus G. Uh, you also have to choose where the market points lie. And for each of these things, you have kind of a strata Delta gamma, which is precisely the corresponds to the locus of point C, that it has precisely this structure. So you have to you need to vary the curves C1, C2, C3 in the genus G1, G2, G3, and choose the points of attachment here. Okay, and the boundary strata of the Jacobian is essentially the same thing, but you also have to add the data of the multi-degree. So we have to choose what type of curve you have, and you have to choose the degrees that we, we have in each of the components. So as we said, we have possible, a lot, some multi-degrees that are possible to have for each nodal curve. And if you choose one, you get uh, a strata, a boundary strata in this universal Jacobian here. Okay, so this is the boundary. I write delta gamma d for the strata in this compact phi Jacobian. Okay. So what are so I we have to describe what the things we are blowing up. So we only blow up boundary strata where gamma, where this combinatorial type has two components. 
So we don't have to blow up more complicated curves. We just have to blow up curves with two components. And so these curves are all disjoint. So for each curve, you have at most one possible degree that is that we have to blow up. That is not where the map is already defined. OK, and we have, I won't get into the detail, but we have also an explicit ordering on how we blow up these boundary strata. And actually, in, in most cases, in good cases, these loci are disjoint. So actually, you can like blow them up all at the same time and have the, the, the resolution. OK, and when I say good cases, so let me go back to the picture. So essentially, in these walls, that uh, is one wall, one parallel direction that it is problematic. So except for, for instance, these all these parallel walls, so these ones is, is not good, but all, all other walls, they have the, the property that the things we are, the blow ups we have to do, they are all in disjoint loss side. Okay, so, so we, so and how do now, let's do the, the formula. So, okay, so let's assume that the loci are disjoint or, or that we have just one blow up to make. So we have just one loci that we have to blow up. And this means, so we have this map here to JD phi one. And over here, you have the exceptional divisor. OK, so and we denote by G the inclusion of the exceptional divisor. And let's say that these loci that we have to uh, that we have to blow up correspond to a pair of binary curves. So of genus G1, D2, and the multi degree is D1, D2. So we can actually find the difference between these two things. So I wrote the difference in the J phi one phi two, but we can just take push forward of this thing and have a, a formula on J phi one. Recall that I, I want to compute this difference, but this is the same as the push forward of the pullback. OK, so. OK, so then what is the, the final formula? So the, the formula, we have a sum. So the difference lives on the exceptional divisor. And, and what it depends? It depends on the, the normal of the exceptional divisor. Note that this is just the self-intersection of E. And on the restriction of the line bundles L to the two components of this curve here. So remember that on J phi one, we have a universal family. And here we have this loss, this loss I, this locus. And over here, the family splits into these two things, which is C1, C2. So you can take the pullback of the universal of the tautological line bundle and restrict to each of the components. And you get, and then take push forward again. So you get these derived complex for each of the restrictions. So there is no one here. There is a one, there is missing a one here. So let me call this L1 to say that it is the tautological line bundle for the polarization phi one. So, so this formula has this assumption that we are only blowing up one loss i, but if we're blowing up this joint loss i, you just have to take a sum over all the exceptional divisors. And we can also find a, a formula in, in every case 
but then it's it's not an easy formula to write, so it won't make much sense to to write it here. So okay, so that's to say that we can compute these difference. So we can compare both Brune other cycles when we have like Jacobians that are for polarizations that are close to each other in the sense that they are adjacent over some some wall. Okay, and thank you. That was my talk. <laughs>